Tom Root was a Renaissance man, a man of energy, intellect, and joy, with a zest for life that influenced everyone who knew him. Today we gather to celebrate Tom, his many interests and achievements. Welcome. I'm Gail Rubin, a certified funeral celebrant, and I am honored to be here with you today for this special gathering. My apologies, I did not reset the Zoom to stop the doorbell ringing when anybody <laughs> enters the meeting. So do know this meeting is being carried live on Zoom and being recorded. So if you have any objections to being on the video, because we will take crowd shots, and maybe you're in the witness protection program, yeah. <laughs> may you want to leave now. <laughs> and also please silence your electronic devices, your cell phone or anything that's going to make noise. I am sorry I can't turn off the doorbell, so hopefully everybody who's coming in is in now. Tom's many talents included gourmet cooking, sewing, and being an all-around Mr. Fix-It. And he loved, loved, loved music, both singing and playing instruments. He played the trombone and the euphonium. That's his euphonium right there, or a euphonium. <laughs> oh, that's a tenor horn. Oh, that's a tenor. <laughs> My apologies, I do not know brass instruments. <laughs> but he played them, and he knew how to play them well. And he also had the remarkable ability to uh, whistle box, toccata, and fugue in D minor. And at midnight on New Year's Eve, he would go out in the street with his trombone and play Old Lang Syne. He was in three bands, including a polka band, the Ambush Brass Band, and the New Mexico Territorial Brass Band here with us today. This band plays period music from the Civil War to 1912, the year New Mexico became a state. Many of their instruments, dare I say, are antiques from the period, excellent. And uh, they are here today, including several who have retired and have returned to help honor Tom at this service. Uh, they will play several pieces over the course of the service. And feel free to sing along if you know the words. We do have the words to some of the songs in your program. And we will start with a song that recognizes the loss that brings us here today, the vacant chair. <laughs>
drew his last breath on July 8th, 2022, at home on hospice care, while his family sang, I'll fly away. While he died at age 72, the vital, intelligent, witty, and loving man that he was throughout his life had long before faded away due to Alzheimer's disease. As someone who washed and reused Ziploc bags and told his son Evan he'd write him out of the will if he didn't recycle glass, <laughs> Tom had an eco-friendly green burial. After he expired, his body stayed at home overnight with family and close friends coming to say goodbye. The next day, his body was wrapped in a shroud and taken to the La Puerta Natural Burial Ground, a Green Burial Council certified cemetery near Belen for a natural burial. We are here today in person and online to support Tom's family, Diane Plummer, his wife, daughter Meredith Root Bowman and her husband Christian, son Evan Root and, and uh, his wife Sarah, and four grandchildren and Tom's four siblings, some of whom are joining us online. And we welcome the many friends he made throughout his remarkable life. And what a full life Tom led. He was born in Madison, Wisconsin to Marguerite and Forest Root on April 16, 1950. He grew up there and in Richland Center, Wisconsin, Atlanta, Georgia, and Lexington, Kentucky. His interest in music developed early. He played baritone horn in the school band and sang in choruses. He also studied Spanish and enjoyed long bicycle rides through the Kentucky countryside. Bicycling was Tom's lifelong passion. In the mid-1970s, he undertook an epic 7,500-mile bicycle trek through South America, ending at the southern tip at Tierra del Fuego. In 1976, he undertook a transcontinental trip of the United States from Virginia to Oregon called the Bike Centennial. He also toured the British Isles and the Rockies of Colorado and New Mexico, taking many century rides of 100 miles. Tom rode his bicycle daily to work at UNM from his home in Knob Hill until he retired. He owned a t-shirt that depicted a person riding past gas pumps with the slogan, passing gas. <laughs> Jim Reinholdt, who now lives in Haley, Idaho, was 20 years old in 1976 when he participated in the bike centennial route with Tom. He carries fond memories and wrote, Tom got us through the 81 days of riding to complete the route. I'm sure bringing together a group of total strangers and keeping them organized was not an easy task. As I look back, I realize that sometimes when facing challenges, my experience with Bike Centennial gave me the confidence to push through and finish. Tom's encouragement along the route was a good life lesson for a young man. Over the course of his varied career, Tom worked in sales, restaurant, and his ultimate calling, education. Early on, he taught fifth grade at an elementary school in Westerville, Ohio. Even though male teachers at the time were not allowed to have beards, Tom got to grow a beard when he played Santa at Christmas, and he kept the beard, and no one complained. The beard was a lifelong feature of Tom's appearance. Tom met his future wife, Diane Plummer, in Santa Cruz, California through mutual friends. 
She was getting her master's degree in social work at San Jose State University, and he was teaching school in nearby Watsonville. He didn't make that great a first impression. <laughs> she, she recalled him as a preppy, some guy with a bicycle and a beard. <laughs> Time went by and their paths crossed again and his true sweet nature became apparent. They were together for four years before they both lost their jobs in California thanks to the state tax revenue decline because of Proposition 13. So they moved to Taos, New Mexico and married there. He used his fluency in Spanish um, during the bike tour of South America and in bilingual and bicultural education. He eventually worked in higher education administration, college admissions, and earned a PhD from the University of New Mexico in 1999. He retired from UNM as the outcome assessment manager in 2014. Dr. Ned Omalia, who worked with Tom at UNM, shared this reflection. Tom was a role model. In an organization where it appeared many people were just putting in their time before retiring, Tom was always involved in several projects at once. And he always wore a pressed shirt every day. Did he iron his own shirts? In the beginning. In the beginning, he <laughs> ironed his own shirts. Okay. He took the laundromat. Oh, the laundromat. Good choice. Tom was, as mentioned, truly a Renaissance man, talented in so many ways. And perhaps what powered his many interests was the coffee he drank all day, every day. And it had to be good coffee. He was a connoisseur. He uh, got beans to grind from our local roasters, Whiting Coffee and Michael Thomas Coffee. And a gourmet in the kitchen, he worked as a baker and chef at the Snow Mansion Adventure Lodge and Hostel in Taos. Diane noted that while he outshone her in the kitchen, he usually cooked for the family just twice a week. She was cooking the other five nights a week. <laughs> but he never shied away from preparing a challenging dish, and he passed a love of cooking on to their children. He loved hiking and camping, embracing love of nature, and the philosophy to leave your campsite better than you found it. And of course, singing around the campfire was a big part of any camping trip. He was meticulous in maintaining and fixing bicycles. He had all the tools. And he was very much a DIY kind of guy. He sewed. He built beds for the kids. He loved playing intensely energetic racquetball and frisbee. And he was a great dad. Even while he was busy earning his PhD and working, he was involved with Meredith and Evan and the YMCA's Camp Shaper. There used to be a program called Indian Guides and Princesses, a bonding activity for fathers and their kids. Tom thought the program name was racist, so he got the Y to change it to Friends Forever. <laughs> Quality time with the kids included trips for ice cream. Evan remembers Tom gave good hugs. If uh, Tom would ask, when was the last time I said I loved you? And if Evan said, I don't know, Tom said, good thing I asked. Evan and Meredith would be Tom's sous chefs as he made home-cooked gourmet meals. The Albuquerque Journal even ran a story about Tom and Evan's cooking together. Evan has fond memories of Friends Forever activities. Bike rides, horseback riding, shooting BB guns and bow and arrow, and hiking many different trails. They went on many family camping trips with friend Michael and Ellie, who are joining us online, Tim, Sandy, Allegra, and Hannah. I have one other memory from Evan to share with you later. Tom's sister, Carolyn, 
shared these thoughts. It is such a difficult journey when we lose someone who loved others so well and who was loved as much as Tom. Nothing ever prepares us for losing someone we love so deeply. He was a wonderful person who touched us all in so many positive ways. My brother Tom and I were only two years apart in age, and I looked up to Tom for his many achievements in academics, theater, and music. He seemed to excel at anything he was involved in. As young adults, Tom and I engaged in many conversations related to our common interest in education. Then, when we had children, we connected over our passion for being parents. At large family gatherings, he was the one whom all the young nieces and nephews gravitated toward. They were delighted by his mischievous side and also loved to roughhouse with him. Tom loved giving the kids attention and always had a frisbee at hand ready to play. Tom loved to cook and could be counted on for his expertise. He loved preparing special meals for others and sharing his skills. At one of our family reunions, he engaged the younger generation in making delightful swan-shaped cream puffs. Tom also had a great sense of humor, and one of my favorite memories of Tom is the way his face would light up with a huge, mischievous smile whenever he cracked one of his frequent puns. <laughs> He was very much a people person and has certainly left us a legacy to treasure and to pass on to others. At this point in the program, we will take a break to hear from video recordings on the video from those who could not be with us here today. And if you have a comment that you would like to videotape, uh, come and talk to me after the service and we can record something right outside the chapel to incorporate in the video that will be on YouTube later on. I'm Christy Raven. I'm the musical director of the New Mexico Territorial Brass Band. And many years ago, I don't remember exactly what year it was, we were playing at the Garcia Opera House in Socorro, New Mexico. The band was in the parking lot warming up and this gentleman wandered by. He had heard us playing from the plaza and asked about us and wondered what kind of group we were. And as we are always hungry for musicians, uh, we told him and asked him to join us. And he is probably one of only a few that actually did. And he played with us for, gosh, 17 or 18 years. It, it was a long time. Tom was a consummate musician. Um, as a director, he was one of my performers that taught me things about being a better musician. Hi, this is Sandy Blaha. Send my love to you, dear Tom. Our 40 years of travels together is just a gift. Your sparkling eyes, your beautiful, stupid humor, <laughs> your love of your family. One of my sweetest memories is um, there was a period of time, and I had known you for a long time before this happened that you and Diane started singing together when we were together. And you both had been such beautiful voices, so sweet. And um, just admired you in many ways. And I have to say to Diane that if any of us ever have to take a long journey like you did with Alzheimer's, that you were just a role model. I remember you saying, he did so much for me. I'm happy to do this for him. And I know that's not easy when you're changing adult diapers. And you were so sweet, so sweet to him. I never saw you lose your patience. Just so my loves, all my love to you. And at this point, I would like to invite Meredith to come up and share her comments. Okay. My dad and I adored each other. I don't remember this, but my dad would tell me about one of his first memories of us together. When he was rocking me back to sleep as a baby, he'd tear up as he told the story of holding me for hours, rocking me and listening to the song, I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now by Perry Como. <laughs> he loved this story. <laughs> 
It was a really poignant moment for him, and I always felt like that treasured first baby. Every time I open my Joy of Cooking cookbook, I think of him and the copy he gave me when I went to college. I use it to make baked custard, pie crust, Irish soda bread, and any and everything I remember being comfort foods from my childhood. <clears throat> I miss being able to call my dad and ask him a cooking question. Those are some of my favorite memories, cooking different dishes in the kitchen with my dad, him teaching me how to cut vegetables without cutting myself, or truss and stuff a turkey. So many of the cooking skills I take for granted I learned from my dad. If we were cooking a French recipe, he would talk in a silly French accent the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> We'd cook, be easy, make a big mess, and clean it up as we went. I'd learn a bunch of new skills at the end and enjoy something very delicious. Almost every weekend, he'd make a special breakfast. A favorite was French toast. Uh, with the really good sourdough, and served with butter and powdered sugar, which made sort of a frosting instead of syrup. Or he'd make a stack of toast with different jams, a pot of coffee, and we'd eat toast while we watched our cartoons. Then after our cartoons, it was his turn to watch this old house, the Woodwright shop, and golf. He said it was relaxing, like watching paint dry. <laughs> For my 16th birthday, I invited a group of close friends over, and he made filet mignon, twice-baked potatoes, asparagus, and homemade pie. Then he and my mom dressed up like a butler and a maid and served us. <laughs> That's something else I remember about my parents. They were such a team, always seeming like the perfect pair for each other, and just game to dress up and do something really fun, silly, and special. My parents were very committed to making my and my brother's birthdays really special since they were in December, and they didn't want our nice days to be overlooked in favor of Christmas. We were king or queen for a day, and my dad would cook whatever we wanted to eat, and my mom would let us dictate all of the activities. When I was in elementary school for my birthdays, my dad would take the entire day to design these intricate treasure hunts with handwritten clues all over the neighborhood. The clues required math, geography, <laughs> riddle solving, use of tools like compasses and maps, and would lead to an actual buried treasure full of jewels, candy, and chocolate gold coins. He always knew the best party games, and he and my mom were fun and silly and spent so much time teaching us how to have fun. My dad was so fun, and he was devoted to making and having fun. Uh, we had done so much, sorry, we had so much fun doing our special YMCA dad and daughter program for uh, Friends Forever. It was kind of like Girl Scouts uh, or Boy Scouts, but we got to do it separately, me and my brother. I went with my dad and he went with my dad. Um, we would get together with other girls and their dads and play mini golf, do crafts, go roller skating, bowling, cook, build things like hot air balloons that, out of paper that really flew and go to camp every year. At camp, he taught me how to shoot a bow and arrow and a BB gun. We hiked, sang camp songs, ate junk food, played games, and just hung out. Looking back, I feel so incredibly lucky to have had that much dedicated fun time with just him and I. I know my brother also valued that one-on-one -on -one time. I remember him taking me on a father-kid backpacking trip near Durango when I was eight. It was my first backpacking trip, and I was the youngest kid there. I carried a pack, and we out-hiked the other dads and the older boys who gave up on the steep, steep climbs and long distances. He kept enticing me up the hill after hill with lemon drops and by singing songs and telling stories. He was so patient and encouraging. Looking back on it now as a parent, trying to convince a reluctant eight-year-old up a giant mountain sounds awful. <laughs> but he seemed to genuinely enjoy this, <laughs> and so I did too. It's definitely one of my favorite memories of a very special trip we took together. He was so proud of me, and that meant a lot to me, to make my dad proud. 
As mentioned, he was this jack of all trades and very crafty. He made me a wooden platform bed with custom shelves, taught me to use a sewing machine. We once made um, our own bean bags to go with the wooden cornhole set he made. And he, my brother and I liked building model rockets and shooting them off in the park. I felt like, and I still feel like, he knows everything, knew everything about everything. He was a walking human encyclopedia who was genuinely curious and interested in knowing what there was to know. He was always ready to do an experiment or ponder some phenomenon. He was so willing to share his knowledge and his skills with me. He was incredibly patient and a teacher at heart. Don't get me wrong, growing up, my dad and I would fight with each other, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was stubborn and he was determined. Even when we disagreed, battled, and fought, it felt like we were playing on the same playing field, fighting on the same playing field, engaging with an equal and worthy opponent. I think he was actually really proud that he had taught me how to stand up for myself, to persevere, and to win. <laughs> When we were kids, he wouldn't let me just win because I was a kid. He'd beat me and then teach me how to employ a better strategy until I could beat him fair and square. He was very strong, very optimistic, confident, and happy. And he was also very sensitive and emotionally in touch with himself and others. He encouraged us to feel our feelings, and I always knew I could go to him with any feeling, any problem, and he would be there to help and support me. I could and did cry on his shoulder many times. My dad was my confidant and the one person whose opinion and advice really mattered to me to seek out. I feel like he was there coaching me through every major life decision I've ever made, giving me good advice on where to go to college, helping me find the best new friends there. They played frisbee. <laughs> and instantly approving of and befriending the man I'd marry. We'd go get ice cream together, sometimes after one of those dad and daughter activities, and sometimes just to spend quality time together and just talk and talk. He had this way of making me feel, even though I was a child, <laughs> like an interesting and important person. I felt so affirmed unconditionally loved and special to him. And he was so special to me. He was my friend, my hero, my teacher, um, and above all, everything a dad and could be ever be to his daughter, sorry. <laughs> we just got each other. And we really, really liked each other. Getting ice cream, especially sharing a banana split, was our thing. We continued those talks as an adult, sometimes over a cobbler, a croissant, a burger, or pizza, or a banana split. And it was one of those talks, during one of those talks, that he confessed to me how scared he was to be losing his wits, driving home, not remembering where he was going. We always talked about real things, scary things, and how we felt about them. <clears throat> He knew how important being real and being vulnerable was, how it made us uniquely human, fragile, and alive. <clears throat> Dad, if you were here, you would say to me, Bunny, we've all got to do it. It's part of life. It doesn't make it any easier, and that's OK. Go ahead and cry. Thank goodness I went first. That's exactly how it's supposed to happen. Dad, thank you for teaching me how to be more like you, how to be strong, how to be compassionate, how to be humble, and most of all, to take nothing for granted. As we remember Tom today, the New Mexico Territorial Brass Band offers the popular Civil War song, Tenting Tonight, also referred to as Tenting on the Old Campground. It was written in 1863 by a New Hampshire musician, Walter Kittredge. <laughs>
Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Tom was dedicated to leaving the world a better place, everywhere he went. He cared about people, justice, and being a good neighbor. He believed in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He was an environmental steward, picking up trash wherever he went. He was civic-minded and donated to the New Mexico Public Interest Research Group. This organization works to advocate for public health, democracy, removing toxic chemicals and waste from the environment, supporting education, educating consumers, and much more. He was loyal and loving. He brought music to the residents of assisted living places and nursing homes. He was very intentional in being the change you want to see in the world. Help, don't judge. We can honor Tom's memory by honoring these values that, the, that he held dear. The Battle Cry of Freedom by composer lyricist George F. Root. A relative, perhaps? No? <laughs> uh, was composed in haste in a single day in response to President Abraham Lincoln's July 1862 call for 300,000 volunteers to fill the shrinking ranks of the Union Army. The song was first performed on July 24th and again on July 26th at a massive war rally. Public response to the battle cry of freedom was overwhelming. When the sheet music was published that fall, 14 printing presses working around the clock were unable to keep up with the demand for copies. Between 500,000 and 700,000 copies were produced.
Peter's disease robbed Tom of his quick wit, his memory, emotions, and eventually his life. It was a long, slow, sad journey for Tom and his family. But we can remember Tom as the vital, loving, active man that he was. Let us remember Tom Root as he was before the shadow of Alzheimer's fell upon him. During this reading, please feel free to recite with me the refrain, we remember Tom. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember Tom. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember Tom. In the opening of the buds and the warmth of summer, we remember Tom. In the rustling of the leaves, and in the beauty of autumn, we remember Tom. In the beginning of the year, and when it ends, we remember Tom. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember Tom. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember Tom. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember Tom. So long as we live, he too shall live, for he is a part of us. We remember Tom. Evan shared a memory from when he was about eight or nine years old. He hadn't been able to sing and hear himself well enough to know if he was singing in tune. While driving to Camp Shaver in the Jemez Mountains, Tom got Evan to sing loudly, which let him know he was singing in tune. They were loudly and happily singing camp songs as they drove into San Ysidro and if you've driven out that way, you know that the, the speed limit will drop suddenly from 65 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour when you get to the village border. Well, Tom completely failed to notice the speed limit change and got pulled over by the one cop who patrols San Ysidro, resulting in a ridiculously expensive speeding ticket. So if you don't normally sing because you think you're not in tune, don't worry about it. <laughs> Some people need to sing loudly to hear if they're in tune. Tom understood that and encouraged it. These were some of his favorite songs to sing around the campfire. And they are in your program and we would encourage you to join in and sing along with gusto.
<laughs> Nobody knows this part. <laughs>
Lang Syne, played by the New Mexico Territorial Brass Band. With the congregation, singing along. The words are in your program. Nobody knows anything past the first verse, but we'll give it our best shot. <laughs> Tom's sister is here and her family. 
Diane. Diane. Diane Sester. Diane. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. What an amazing life we have celebrated here today. And the celebration continues back at the house. Uh, if you don't know where it is, talk to the family. <laughs> and there uh, you'll have the opportunity to write down three words that say Tom to you. Uh, maybe share some remembrances. If you would like to share a video remembrance that I'll incorporate into the video of this service that will be on YouTube later, uh, talk to me afterwards. Please allow the family to exit first so they can greet you outside the chapel. And go forth and carry Tom's goodness with you and share the love that he carried in this world. And don't be afraid to sing loudly. <laughs> Tom would approve.